We are especially thankful to have Professor Tariq Pickens visiting us from Bates College all the way out in Maine. Just by way of introduction, I'll give you a little bit of the background. Uh, she got her undergraduate in comparative lit from Princeton, so she's no stranger to the cold, um, and then got her PhD in comparative lit here at UCLA, so welcome home. Uh, her research focuses on Arab American and Af African American literatures and cultures, disability studies, philosophy, and literary theory, and I think amongst other things. I feel like those are the main ones. But that's not enough. She's also a creative writer. <laughs> She's a poet, and her poetry has appeared in Black Renaissance, Save the Date, and the Disability Studies Quarterly. And her drama has been performed at the New Jersey State Theater. Um, and then, of course, she has already published a book, um, and it's entitled New Body Politics. She'll be talking about it a bit more. And in case anybody in here has to leave early, I just need to mention that Susan Birch will be speaking on April 6th, and Ellen Samuels will be on May 18th. They're our final two speakers of this speaker series, so we hope you'll continue to join us. Without further ado, mm -hmm. Professor Tariq Pickens. Uh, last year, I published my first book, <laughs> um, an offshoot and development of the dissertation entitled New Body Politics, Narrating Arab and Black Identity in the Contemporary United States. In it, I explore two major questions. How do everyday embodied experiences transform from being merely anecdotal to having social and political significance? And what can the experience of corporeality that is being embodied offer social and political discourse? Why does that matter? I was especially interested in what that discourse looks like, sounds like, when it concerns Arab Americans and black Americans. The monograph explores a wide variety of literary, cultural, and archival material to come to one particular conclusion. Arab Americans and African Americans rely on the fragile body. In contrast to culturally conscripted ideas about emotional or physical strength, right, and we're all familiar with those, right, the strong black woman, the virile black man, the strong Arab terrorist, the strong Arab woman, right? We are all familiar with those that conjure um, emotional and physical strength, right? So they're, they're not using those bodies. They're using the fragile body, the body that breaks, the body that cries, the body that's vulnerable, to craft urgent social and political critiques. They find particular potential in mundane experiences, like breathing, touch, illness, pain, death. The quotidian becomes a space of complicated critique about the nation state, domestic and international politics, exile, cultural mores, and the medical establishment. Just out of curiosity, how many people in here are pre-med? Oh, oh. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of experience teaching pre-med students at UCLA. I also have a lot of experience being a patient, and so Seeing people on both sides of the equation is, uh, is often fun. Come on in, water's fine. Um, in many ways, I feel like my book is timely. Uh, in our current moment, the United States, both culturally and legally, seeks to make sense of the Arab Spring, public anxiety about Iraqi, Afghanistan military involvement. We're living in a time of war, in a time of conflict. So many of us grapple with the way police brutality and vigilante justice marks black and brown bodies as fungible, disposable, ungrievable. And here, domestic and foreign policy interests collide on Arab and black bodies. I was wondering uh, how people in those bodies have responded. And without sounding defensive, I want to pinpoint the particular utility of the humanities in dealing with these concerns. Literature, as a space of the imagination, allows us to understand narratives at work. So that when we, um, sorry, so that we can divert the ones going down a terribly well-worn path and imagine new avenues upon which to trod. All right, so if we are all familiar with the stories and they all seem to progress in a certain way, when you read literature, you get a chance to imagine something different. Mm -hmm. um, and without em embarrassing her, um, there is a poet in the audience who took words and transform them into being something completely different. Uh, sperm Kit, Supermarket, The Collection, which is amazing, uh, by Harriet Mullen, asks you to reimagine what words can do. And so if you are thinking in terms of literature and you are a pre-med person and you think about the narratives that are at play or at work and you can imagine new ones, you can help your patients do something different with their lives. 
So for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus on one portion of the book that participates in that kind of analysis and is um, participating in a kind of unfortunate timeliness as well, my discussion of Irvin Magic Johnson's national narrative of HIV and AIDS. <clears throat> During much of last year, we were hit, all hit by a media barrage about Ebola. And very recently, you guys were hit with a media barrage about super viruses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for a variety of reasons, the language and rhetoric of this particular pandemic, that is Ebola, and also a little bit the super virus um, national narrative story, uh, demonstrates that we've learned very little about it, uh, very little since our experience with HIV and AIDS in uh, the late 1980s and early 1990s. National narratives like this make clear that the dispersal of information is not as wide as we would want, nor is it as, as, nor is it as informed as we desire. Most people don't get their information from epidemiologists, physicians, right? They get their news from Facebook and Twitter, right? And think pieces, which means that how we write or talk as pundits or in think pieces bear significant repercussions for public health. Despite the fact that only two people in the US died from Ebola, the public watch for the disease was tinged by a sense of clear and present danger lurking around every sink, on every airplane, and between each moment of human contact. And I'm reminded, since I was sitting in the airport for a very long time last night, there was a coffee McSneezerton who decided that he was going to forego the use of tissue and just cough into his hands. And he got up and he wanted to introduce himself to me and talk to me about whatever, and I was just like, it's nice to meet you. <laughs> and I waited so he proceeded to his seat, thankfully way back in the plane, the rear of the plane. And then I used all of my hand sanitizer to touch everything I had come into contact with. Um, all travelers were advised to do what I do, wipe down their seat backs and tray tables in addition to keeping them in their upright and locked positions. <laughs> the United States did impose travel restrictions, routing flights from affected countries into five major airports, of which LAX was one. Other countries canceled flights, limited visas, or closed their borders entirely. The public health scare had several registers. First, people were afraid yet again of disease coming from the putative dark continent of Africa. Second, despite the science, people panicked about the possibility of contracting the illness in ways that were not possible. <laughs> because Ebola, like rabies and influenza, is zoonotic, that is, it jumps species, people, bless you, begin to speculate about the ways West Indian immigrants would spread the disease within the United States, mostly due to food, um, food practices. Third, fear took a cultural turn in the United States that was consistent, bless you, with US public health history. Because the disease came from the continent of Africa and the only two patients to die were black, some feared that the US government's response would not be adequate were there to be an outbreak in minority communities. And for those of you familiar with the histories of public health, this fear is not completely unfounded. These fears should strike anyone familiar with the history of HIV and AIDS as eerily similar, bless you, to what occurred in the 1980s, travel restrictions, fear, zoonosis, xenophobia, racism, public health concerns, distrust of medical personnel, distrust of government intervention. This is part of what I would call the unfortunate timeliness of my work. Ebola as a public health issue raises serious concerns about what we are prepared to handle as a public in the face of infectious disease. It also reminds us of the ways the commonplace ideas inflected, perhaps infected, with racism, xenophobia, homophobia, sexism, ableism, and all the isms that should be wasms, right? Uh, determine both discourse and action because they masquerade as common sense. It's this common senseness, this commonplaceness, that makes the events quotidian and mundane despite the public outcry about them. Returning to my earlier questions, it becomes imperative to ask how and why these events garner significant public um, pol political capital. What shifts occur when black and brown bodies are centralized in these stories? Urban Magic Johnson's national narrative about HIV and AIDS speaks directly to this question, to these questions. How many of you are familiar with Magic Johnson, the basketball player, and not the public pundit? 
Okay, very few. All right, so he was a basketball player. <laughs> um, and his career started, I'm just going to give you a brief overview, broad strokes, started in 1978. And it was always pitched as a rivalry between him and Larry Bird, who was um, a Boston Celtic. Um, and for those of you who watch YouTube, the clip of the Boston Celtics fan not kissing the person on kiss cam, I don't know if you've seen this. Anyway, his, uh, <laughs> the Chicago Bull beats up the Celtics fan. But the rudeness of the Celtics fan um, is, should give you a hint of what Larry Bird was like. Very abrasive, very rude, very staid on court, never smiled. Whereas Magic Johnson was always smiling, always assisting, right? He was famous for assists um, and consistently a razzle-dazzle player. So the, these two ideas of, of their rivalry gives, um, gives a sense of what their play was like. The Lakers being Showtime players, constantly um, high-fiving up and down the court, making it feel like fun, whereas the Celtics were very serious. They were the big three. Um, they had a, a presence that was very much about the seriousness of the game, about winning, about the sport of it. Does that give you guys a sense of who he was? And he was, he was always smiling. He was famous for his smile. Um, so some of this might actually be uh, not necessarily interesting to you, um, but he did transform from being a public figure to being little more than a historical footnote um, or clickbait on an online article. And after more than two decades since he contracted HIV, we have to wonder how that transformation from public figure to uh, pundit occurred and the mechanisms by which he was not sustained as an activist. To be sure, his intervention into HIV and AIDS discourse was a game changer. He entered public consciousness as HIV positive in 1991 during his prime as a basketball star, upending the distinction assumed in HIV and AIDS between gay and straight, black and white, guilty and innocent, and to a lesser extent, men and women. As a result, Johnson was able to speak directly to young audiences and black folk who erroneously believed that HIV and AIDS did not affect them. Yet, as we progress in time, Johnson's ability, and some would argue his desire, though I'm not necessarily sure that's true, to speak to those audiences, that is young folk and black folk, or you know, both, um, has deteriorated significantly. For a time, Johnson's personal story, that is his embodied experience, was socially and politically significant. What happened? Johnson's narrative foregrounds the reciprocity of being embodied in the world, that is seeing and being seen, touching and being touched, as well as the way one's body is anchored by the confines of time, space, and sociopolitical milieu. As a sports star, Johnson was understood mostly as a subjective object, that is people watched him, right? Most people intended him or apprehended him, that is understood and watched um, him for the purpose of watching his body in motion, really watching him in positions like these. Um, in other words, the public remained oriented toward him as an object, really not another person, against whom or against which they defined themselves. When he announced his HIV positive status, he changed the terms of this engagement as he emphasized his own ability to give the world meaning, that is he emphasized his own position as a subject. And there's a tension here, since everyone is always both a subject and an object. So right now, I am in some ways an object to you, even though I am a subject in myself. Does that make sense? Okay, so we're always both at the same time. And there's a tension here when someone's trying to emphasize their own ability to give the world meaning, and you've consistently viewed them as a subject, or sorry, you've consistently viewed them as an object. For Johnson's narrative, part of the conflict stems from the general public's understanding of what healthy looks like and the reality of what it feels like or what it can be. To be clear, Johnson's ability to somatize health, however fraught the definition and image of putative health, is at the crux of his ability to engage in political discourse. In other words, here comes a quote, the tension between health as therapeutic intervention and as a vehicle for social change is not a matter of putting politics into or keeping it out of healthcare. Indeed, the conception of who is healthy and who is not is already a political issue. Now, some of you have read the written version of this chapter, and I'm glad for it. Um, and so you'll notice that the framework is a little different. Uh, there, I lay out the cultural circumstances of the 1980s and early 1990s that made Johnson's narrative possible. 
I find that activism prior to Johnson, specifically that of the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, or ACT UP, spectacularized the body and made HIV and AIDS awareness um, hinge on images of the body, specifically in dying or ill repose, right? So people were always emaciated and sickly, or it was the virile, active bodies of survivors. And then in the chapter, I turn to Johnson's mobilization of his own body and his embodied experience immediately after his public announcement in 1991. I point to the ways that Johnson intervenes in the competing discourses about HIV and AIDS, sexuality, basketball, and black success. And if I had more time, because you know there's never enough time in any of these things, I would talk to you about all of that, but I can't. Um, so just kind of jumping back in here, he had to, Johnson had to rely on and undercut his visually objectified body that remained in the public imaginary. He had to provoke people to look at him this way um, and then change the way they understood him. And for the purposes of this talk, I want to focus on the one moment after Johnson became legible <clears throat> as an AIDS icon and two moments that clarified the limitations of his embodiment vis-a-vis -vis his activism. And I want to unpack why it's so difficult being magic while having HIV and what the implications are for us. Um, on November 7, 1997, Urban Magic Johnson dramatically shifted the conversations about HIV and AIDS. His athletic black body upended notions of what HIV and AIDS could look like and who could have it. HIV and AIDS was no longer there, meaning whites, gays, sinners problem, but was now our, read blacks, heterosexuals, innocents problem. And I put those in quotation marks because obviously those are weird and not true, but it's important to think about the way that, that folks were conceptualizing this at the time. He announced, and this is a picture of the announcement, uh, that he would retire from the NBA and his stellar career, and I, I, it is of note that his career was spectacular. Okay. Um, as an LA Laker, because he had tested positive <coughs> for HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. And for those of you who are keeping track of me, I am being very careful about the attention paid to the distinction between HIV and AIDS because they are two different things. Um, and it's important to note the difference and important to note that when they're being pushed together that I'm trying to deal with both. <clears throat> Johnson's impact on HIV and AIDS activism was due in significant part to his palatability to white audiences, and here's someone else's words, as the ambassador of basketball with the unforgettable smile. And I just want to take a moment here and point you to this picture. So in uh, his book co-authored with Larry Bird and Jackie McMullen, he writes about the agony of picking out this red tie. Um, and you know, reading it, you're like, yeah, magic, whatever, you had to pick out a tie, big whoop. But for someone to focus on a mundane thing, like what to wear, when he's making arguably one of the biggest announcements of his life, should clue you in that there are some things that, that just are part of the lived experience, right? And so what he remembers, what he found important to talk about in that, in that moment in the book was the difficulty of picking out that tie. And he decided on red because it was his power color, which is interesting because it wasn't purple or yellow, which were the colors of the Lakers. Um, and red then gets associated or has been associated with blood with the HIV AIDS um, activism um, and with Republicans, which is fascinating <laughs> uh, given, his, um, given his history with, with black conservatism in particular. So this moment of sort of sartorial difficulty I think is, is useful to note and also interesting that it, it humanizes um, him in that moment in the, in, in the book um, because he because he's worried about what to wear as the rest of us are sort of reading the book trying to figure out well, what was he thinking about having HIV. He's like, I was thinking, what tie am I going to wear? Um, which if you've ever had a chronic illness or you've ever been dealing with anything, sometimes those small things are the things that get the freak out, whereas the larger issue is not necessarily the thing that you're most concerned about. Um, so a lot of other scholars have written on, on Magic Johnson. Uh, Kathy Cohen, Douglas Crimp, and Chris Bell have pointed out that Johnson's status as an icon is predicated on the erasure of black gay men, lesbian women, and IV drug users with HIV and AIDS. I concur. And I would add that part of what made and makes Johnson a difficult figure regarding his activism is the vexing influence of his athletic and suddenly ill but not debilitated body 
Images of Johnson relied on the public's perception of people with HIV and AIDS as emaciated, sickly, and unhappily alone. So you've got to imagine that uh, what we were thinking was that this is the Johnson we knew. Um, and so when we get this moment, there's a difficulty in conceptualizing it. In the early 1990s, Johnson's engagement with HIV and AIDS activism and his role as the supposed new face of HIV attempted to disrupt some of the common cultural narratives about the body with HIV and AIDS. Not only did it upend the idea that all HIV and AIDS patients were emaciated and sickly, it also allowed for a different sympathetic face and persona to be associated with the disease. Prior to Johnson's announcement, Ryan White, a young white hemophiliac, gained attention when he was barred entry from school because he had AIDS in 1985. White and his family became AIDS activists, activists by default because his youth presumed heterosexuality, and I say presumed here because he was a child, um, and I think it's important that that presumption was made. Uh, and his whiteness allowed him some distance from those people considered quote-unquote immoral AIDS patients like gay men and IV drug users, even though White himself eschewed the label innocent. In short, White's body brought with it the contours of a white and heterosexual privilege regarding HIV and AIDS, the assumption of innocence, and the belief in his inherent value. Those privileges received state sanction in August 1990 when the United States passed the Ryan White Comprehensive AIDS Resources Emergency Act, or the CARE Act, and posthumous recognition of Ryan White. The act, which federally funded programs for low-income and uninsured people with AIDS, placed a government stamp on HIV and AIDS as an issue of national importance, something that had, something was slow for the government to do prior to this. Nonetheless, naming it after Ryan White shunted aside the significant others that HIV and AIDS affected, and it placed a white face on the legislation in perpetuity, codifying into law the erasure of people of color, LGBTQI people, women, and those whose identities included two or more of those categories. And President Barack Obama extended the act for the fourth time in 2009. So earlier when I talked about stories, I want to just kind of pinpoint the fact that this is a story that was codified not only legally, but culturally. Because at the time, Michael Jackson wrote a song called Gone Too Soon in recognition of Ryan White. And Elton John penned an open letter to him. So these, this became the story that we told about HIV and AIDS, that it was only worthwhile when we were dealing with innocent white children and not anyone who was not that. Right? So this was the story that we had, and Magic Johnson changes it a little bit. In an effort to educate others about HIV and AIDS, Johnson showcased his own embodied experience and put his body on display. Here, um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about rumors, because this is what he was relying on in order to put his body on display. Here's the thing about rumors. If you've ever been the subject of a rumor, or you've ever watched reality TV, <laughs> you know this, right? Rumor is often difficult to discuss because it is unsubstantiated and therefore rendered illegitimate, even though people discuss it with an acute legitimacy, right? Did you hear? Did you know? Right? It's discussed as though it is truthful. However, right, even despite its illegitimacy, it becomes part of the public discourse in a way that has a specific and strange effect on celebrities. And celebrity as outlined by anyone you consider famous in your field. So there's academic celebrity, um, there's folks who are celebrities on campus, and then there's folks that are celebrities in quote unquote the real world, right, like Mimi Leakes. <laughs> um, so, uh, Johnson's attempt to respond to rumors about his sexuality, right, when he came out as HIV positive, people thought, oh, he's gay and he's having sex with white men. Um, but this was his attempt, his showcase of his body, his attempt to respond to rumors about his sexuality. Um, and that attempt uh, to respond functions similarly to other rumor mills in that both public speculation and public repudiation of rumor become part of the official discourse about any given celebrity. So there's no way to talk about, say, Ooh, who can I pick on? I'll just say any given celebrity without dealing with both the rumors about them and their desire to deny them. Okay. Kim K is actually an excellent example. Um, okay, sorry, I'll just let that linger there. <laughs> um, 
Johnson's public display of his body transforms the conversation about what constitutes an ill body, right? So when he puts his body on display, given that we consider him looking like this, and he says, and he says I have HIV, um, this changes things because he's not sickly, uh, even if the rumors about him resist a kind of erasure. So I want to turn to his, one of his first public appearances uh, in Michael Jackson's Remember the Time video in March 1992. So he announced in November 91, and then he shows up in Michael Jackson's video in 1992 because this creates a counter discourse about what illness looks like, the somatic appearance of illness. And as with many Michael Jackson videos after Thriller, Remember the Time is a short film featuring several star protagonists. Um, one of the things that I just want to point out to you is that as we kind of think about Michael Jackson videos, particularly now that he's no longer with us, right, people don't like to talk about the rumors that were operating while he was alive. Um, many of them dealt with speculation about his sexuality, um, not just about pedophilia, but about this idea that he was having sex with his pet monkey Bubbles and he had this sort of nebulous relationship with Brooke Shields. Um, but if you think about videos as a cultural text, what you get are a, uh, are a series of ideas that correspond to how people are not only interpreting what's happening in the video, but how folks in the video have lives outside of the video that people are also interpreting, right? So if you think about, I don't know, when do Taylor and Taylor show up on screen together? Like Taylor Lautner and Taylor Swift show up on screen together at some point, right? <laughs> And like, there's something about the number 13. No, no one knows what I'm talking about. Okay. Thank you, Valentine's Day. I knew it was one of those movies with like a million people in it. Okay. Um, so they show up on screen together and it's so cute because we know it's Taylor and Taylor and like there's a number 13, but that's not about what's happening on screen. That's about what we know about Taylor Lautner and Taylor Swift who are not Taylor Lautner and Taylor Swift on screen. No no okay. So what you would have seen <laughs> um, would have been Magic Johnson playing a uh, court attendant, uh, which in some cases is kind of a eunuch, um, and he is arbitrating this uh, sexual triangle um, between Eddie Murphy, supermodel Iman, um, and Michael Jackson. Right. So that's part of what you see, but he's also shirtless, and his his entrance is marked by an attention to his ankles and his feet. You don't have to move, I'm good. <laughs> uh, an attention to his ankles and his feet, which is fascinating because as a basketball player, his footwork, his fancy footwork, is what is responsible for much of his success. So when you go home and you watch the first four minutes of the video, because I know you will, um, or I hope you will, um, then that's what you'll see. So for now, I will just pretend that we've all seen it. Um, to understand this video as a cultural text requires reading it alongside, obviously, these rumors about Johnson, Jackson, and Murray, uh, and Murphy, sorry. Uh, in, in case you didn't know, Michael Jackson, Eddie Murphy, <laughs> Iman, <laughs> um, and Eddie Murphy now has a lot more rumors at play about him, um, but I'll just, I'll leave that there. Um, and what I'm about to say does not mean that I endorse or believe any of the rumors. I just want to make sure that is on record. Um, but that they work uh, within a larger narrative about the video it becomes kind of a meta text. The three men perform sexualized roles that rely on heteronormativity and obliquely suggest that these rumors that are being said about them are not true. First, right, people suspected Johnson was gay because of his announcement of his HIV status. And given that HIV and AIDS was often associated with white gay men, some were unable to reconcile Johnson's heterosexuality with his diagnosis. Second, Michael Jackson's sexuality had long been speculated upon because of his assiduous attention to his monkey Bubbles, who appears in another video entitled Leave Me Alone, and his nebulous relationship with actress Brooke Shields. Third, Eddie Murphy had been romantically linked to his friend, singer Johnny Gill, um, and gender non-conforming sex worker, Divine Brown. Interesting story, happened in LA. You might wanna look it up. <laughs> um, Johnson's role as a court attendant places him as an arbiter between Iman and Murphy, suggesting he be read um, as part of a, sorry, Jackson. No, Johnson's role as a court attendant, yes, between Iman and Murphy, uh, suggesting he be read as part of a heteronormative love triangle that features Murphy and Jackson as virile men in combat over a beautiful woman. 
And Johnson's facilitation of Jackson's ability to woo Iman, there's actually an on-screen kiss, um, ironizes Johnson's role on the basketball court as someone famous for assists. And for those of you who don't know what assists are, it's the person that passes it to you before you make the shot. Uh, yet the difficulty of dispelling rumors is that no amount of denial assists any of the men in affirming their heterosexuality. For instance, the campiness of the video might suggest a queer space where all the participants exaggerate heterosexuality as part of the performance. In any of the possible interpretations, the video functions as part of the archive in which heterosexuality and queerness remain side by side as this collection of data. So part of what's happening in this story is that you have Johnson as um, presumed gay, you have him as in this video looking virile, and for people who thought he was attractive, still attractive, um, and then you have Jackson and his rumors, and you know some people could say, oh, well clearly they're all straight, look at them going to war over Iman, or some people could say, well clearly they're all gay because this is a performance, right? So there's a sense there that all of these stories are existing side by side. For Johnson, the video becomes a PSA about the indiscriminate nature of HIV and AIDS, his visible body, remember he's shirtless, um, along with the knowledge of his HIV status, allows him to insist on his heterosexuality with varying results, embody risk, and perform wellness. Johnson affirms his health in terms of the visual codes attributed to having HIV and AIDS. He's neither emaciated, nor isolated, nor covered with KS lesions, which are usually large purple um, spots. For anyone who's seen Philadelphia, you'll, um, You'll know what I'm talking about. His shirtless appearance also marks him as virile since he's still lean, muscular, and for those who thought he was attractive, attractive. I have in here in French, there's no accounting for taste. Um, because I don't actually find Magic Johnson attractive. <laughs> um, <laughs> despite his virility and desirability, his position as court attendant and possibly eunuch along with the knowledge of his HIV status, neuters his sexuality. He exudes sexiness, but also embodies the consequences of promiscuous sex. Viewers have to ever be mindful of the Johnson they see before them and the reality of his positive status, his body as both image and object. Though Johnson's presence attempts to affirm heterosexuality and desirability, it perhaps, um, uh, it also and perhaps more stringently affirms the danger of both. This ostensible PSA relies on a delicate balance between the public's expectation that he will appear sick and his message that anyone can live with HIV. <coughs> he must rely on the vexed nature of being an off-limits sex symbol. And given that many women found Johnson attractive while in the MBA, money and fame notwithstanding, <laughs> part of his ability to sell safe sex to men rests on his ability to still be attractive to women. The potency of his activism depends upon his embodiment of the risk associated with carrying a desirable but lethal erection. In the 21st century, two events clarify how the anxiety about Johnson's body resulted in a distancing from him, uh, reimagining him as an object, and a culturally convenient amnesia about the historical context of Johnson's narrative. Right? So when we lose history, and we lose a part of the strand of the story, we lose something particularly significant. In 2007, comedy personalities and celebrities gathered to participate in the Comedy Central Roast of Flavor Flav, a rapper come reality television star. Flavor Flav was once the hype man for a public enemy. And I'm showing you this deliberately because this is what he looked like before, okay? Um, he was once a hype man for Public Enemy, a politically conscious rap group famous during the 1980s, but Flavor Flav had his, we'll call it a fall from grace, we'll be kind, <laughs> after drug use and repeated incarcerations. During the roast, comedian Samore told Flavor Flav that he looked like what Magic Johnson was supposed to look like. Oh. Yeah, so I've, I've given this talk several different times and every time the audience has that reaction because it is so... What? Did she say that? Everyone's kind of surprised um, and a little offended. Her statement brings to the fore the disjuncture between what we now see of Johnson, which is this, uh, versus what we think we know about his seropositivity. Flavor Flav's, sorry, so many of the jokes that night were about Flavor Flav's appearance. Um, no shade, this is what he looks like. 
um, about his appearance, his height, his dark complexion, his weathered skin, his small build. Right? Um, some more comments point to the understanding of HIV and AIDS as something that shrinks the body in size and ages the skin, which is actually not true. That is usually the, the weathered skin is usually the result of having been on heart drugs for a very long time, right? It's a side effect. And I can tell you as someone who, I'm from New Jersey, um, and I was a teenager when Flavor Flay was having his fall from grace. Um, and he would hang out in New Jersey, um, in various parts of Newark where uh, my family currently lives. And I have met Flavor Flay. So without heels, I'm 5'4". Okay, five four and a quarter. I'm gonna hold on. I'm gonna hold on very strongly to my quarter. Um, but uh, he looked me in the eye, right? Um, and while he was in the throes of a drug habit, he definitely was deteriorating. There's a lot of life on his face in terms of the weathered skin. This is actually him with a little bit of makeup. His skin's not really that smooth. Um, so it's important to note that a lot of the jokes that were being made were dependent upon his drug use and, um, and him, being, him having been incarcerated. So some more references Flavor Flav's past drug addiction, right? And the HIV AIDS diagnosis he presumably escaped. And this moment showcases that people expected and still expect Magic Johnson's body to evince his diagnosis. And it bears emphasizing that Johnson's ability to somatize health also circumscribes his activism in the present moment. For a man aging with HIV, a long-term side effect of being on heart drugs is that shrinkage of the skin. It's called lipoatrophy, an emaciation of the face. And it's not my aim, again, to speculate about whether Johnson has had lipoatrophy or surgery to correct it, but to point out that the fact that we see that smile, that trademark smile, um, and the girth of his face sub uh, subscribes to common notions of health. Moreover, some Moore's joke comments on the classed <clears throat> nature of Johnson's experience with illness. In other words, Johnson should look like someone with HIV or AIDS, an assertion that further emphasizes the distinction between Johnson and other less wealthy people with HIV and AIDS. And if I had copyright, I would play you Kanye West's song, Roses, where he talks about if Magic Johnson has a cure for AIDS and all the broke people have passed away, you know, what, it is, what he's asking, what do we do with that? And I don't normally give credence to Kanye as someone who's speaking truth, but that song, that part of that song, that question, is useful. <laughs> um, Samora's comment also brings to light how Magic's vexed cultural cachet functions given the constraints of his bodily image. What do we do with someone who's looking like this um, when we expect him to look, apparently, like this, right? Um, while Flavor Flav has had to suture a career together, and I mean suture, right? He's been grabbing at all straws that tossed his way. Um, based on reality TV shows and an embrace of his look as ugliness, and in fact, he talks about himself in those terms, Johnson has been able to avoid the oblivion reserved for celebrities whose primary careers are over, right? He's got businesses, he's a pundit. We see Magic Johnson talking about everything from Kobe to Dennis Rodman in North Korea to Donald Sterling. We go to him for all kinds of tidbits and information. Cat Williams, who was another participant in the roast, in fact, he was the host, he bemoaned the racist overtone to the evening, saying that the writers of the show consistently referred to Flavor Flav as a, and I apologize for anyone with delicate sensibilities, crispity, crackly, crunchity coon, end quote. Uh, Williams does not overtly connect the racism with the obvious commentary on Flavor Flav's body, nor does he explicitly mention some more comments, but he does point out the way his own complicity hinged upon him being paid. All right, so again, money curtails the conversations one can have about being embodied as black or as ill. In 2008, Minneapolis conservative talk show hosts Chris Baker and Langdon Perry accused Johnson of, quote, faking AIDS for sympathy, end quote. Now there's this thing, I went to Minnesota once. I was there for a job interview. And they were telling me about this thing called Minnesota nice, where people are just nice just because. <laughs> this DJ comment speaks to the fact that Minnesotans are just as shady <laughs> as everybody else. Um, so don't let the cute accent fool you. Um, anyway, <laughs> maybe it's just them. Maybe it's just these hosts. 
Um, but they, they later apologized, but that sentiment evinces a more palpable shift, I think, from the public's shock in 1991 at Johnson's diagnosis to a disbelief of it. Some mores and the Minnesotans, Minnesotan DJ's disbelief epidermalizes, and that's kind of a technical term to think about the way that his skin and his body is, is brought into the foreground. Johnson, by keeping him as a black athletic body rather than a black athletic body who has an illness or a disability. Both comments ignore Johnson's social grounding in the 1990s as a black man with HIV for comedic fodder. In an effort to understand Johnson's anchoring in the social world influenced by his activism, I find it instructive to examine the limitations placed on his black athletic body in time. Um, according to Anthony Foy, the black athlete is limited in his ability or her ability um, thinking particularly about Serena Williams here, to construct an autobiographical I in real time. Foy argues that the black athlete's entrance into autobiography pulls from a long tradition of black literary self-expression, dating to slave narratives. But the black body in action thwarts the transformative potential of literary autobiography because that autobiography has already been performed in the athlete's body. That is, we don't allow them or accept them to create their own narratives because we feel like we've already seen them. Does that make sense? I need a head nod, an amen, a thank you, okay. <laughs> um, so similarly, Johnson's ability to construct an autobiographical eye, that is his ability to tell us who he is with HIV, is limited based on his linguistic recourse to his sports career. So if anyone um, takes a look at the archive, I think there's um, a couple of magazines I actually pulled from when I was doing the research here. Um, he calls uh, HIV and AIDS it, right? He says, I'll, I'll get through it, I'll deal with it. He configures it as, a, as an opposing team. Um, and people begin to insist on his ability at the expense of his illness. I apologize for those of you following along. I'm doing a little bit of remixing here. Uh, Inasmuch as Johnson harnesses his body to help construct a competing discourse to the narratives about HIV and AIDS, that is to create another story, his body cannot sustain that discourse along with those narratives about black male athleticism and illness. There exists a wide gulf between his static self as showcased in Michael Jackson's video and public photo opportunities and his moving self as shown on the court and elsewhere. Right? So we have two different Johnsons operating in public space and no one really knows what to do with them. So people are going back to the Johnson they know, the athletic Johnson. Samora's commentary and the Minnesotan DJ's joke explode as antagonistic in an examination of Johnson's athletic black body at rest. Johnson had several retirements, right? And this had, had become a running joke. How many times was he going to retire? After his announcement in 1991, after the Cleveland Cavs game in 1992, and in 1996, after the Lakers lost to the Houston Rockets in the first round of the playoffs. And it was a terrible loss. I think if you watch it on ESPN Classic, like you really feel for the Lakers because they're going through things as they're losing. It's fascinating. Um, during the Cleveland Cavs game in 92, Johnson received a very small cut, um, <clears throat> and the Lakers physician fixed him up without gloves. So if you watch this also on ESPN Classic, you can actually still hear the public go, <gasps> as the physician just takes a Band-Aid and places it on his, on his arm. Everyone is alarmed because there's blood, and it's, it's going to infect everybody. right? Um, Johnson retired from the NBA after that because of the palpable nature of the player sphere and the public. It's also worth noting that Carl Malone spoke out against Magic Johnson being in the NBA at this time. Um, and you get the sense from watching Carl Malone speak out that his fear is not really about touching Magic on court, but about the fact, sorry, not the fact, about the speculation that they were engaged in uh, sexual activity with some of the same women, oh. right? So this, this idea that Carmelone's fear isn't about Johnson on the court, but about Johnson on the road, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a lot happening there in terms of those discourses. Uh, his short stint, you know, between 91 and 92, proved how tenuous the public's acceptance of him was at the time, right? So he wouldn't have been faking AIDS for sympathy, because it wasn't clear he would have gotten sympathy at the time. Um, and how meager their understanding of HIV and AIDS was. It was clear that Johnson's ability to be a good spokesman would need to be based on his body, but not his body and athletic motion. 
Part of the reason Johnson remains an enigma is because his athletic rest is politically provocative. And for those of you who are students of history, you'll remember that most black bodies, um, uh, black athletic bodies at rest are politically provocative. So in the 60s, you had this at the um, Olympics, right, when, when folks were protesting. Um, <clears throat> then you had the melee in Motown um, when, uh, what was his name before? Uh, Ron Artest, now Meta World Peace, um, got on the got on the table and 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 laid there <laughs> to suspend the game clock. So all of that rest ends up being politically provocative because it it changes the time space continuum we associate with with athletes. Um, players at rest, right, refigure the understanding of black bodies in white public space by controlling the temporality of the NBA and suspending through their inertia the game clock. In other words, the black subject is mired in space and the white subject represents the full expanse of time. Um, those words are from Sharon Holland and she talks about them particularly in the black-white uh, racial binary, but her words also echo for most people of color. That when you think about um, the narrative of Western progression, the same narrative that gives us post-racial rhetoric Whiteness is constructed as the arbiter of time and progress, and white understandings of race and racism determine whether we've reached racial harmony. In this ordering, black subjects only take up space. People of color only take up space. They're the bodies to get behind, and they are what gets labeled post, right? We're always post-blackness, post-Asian-ness, post-Latino-ness, right? We're never post-whiteness, because that is the ordering of time. That's the main narrative we're all dealing with. So when black subjects seek to control time, they change this ordering. They also truncate the narrative of progress, which is this narrative where we move forward in time, minute by minute, second by second, hour by hour, um, and they force people to engage with the way that story, that movement from, say, 1492 to 1776 to 2008, right? And I'm signifying on particular American movements in time. Right? Um, that those stories are predicated on an erasure of people of color. Right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Right? So if we tell 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue in one way, we're erasing a whole bunch of people. If we tell 1776 in another way, we're erasing a whole bunch of people. Right? And if we tell 2008 in one way, we're erasing a whole bunch of people. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So given this heavily racialized understanding of Johnson, and I'm going to refer, refer you back to the stories of him and Larry Bird as a black versus white competition, Johnson was shaped by a mainly white-owned industry that controlled time. So when he steps off the court and he says, hi, I'm HIV positive, he stands outside the parameters of this temporal control. Off the court with HIV, Johnson more explicitly occupies a racialized and politicized subjectivity that shapes its own time. Drawing on his configuration of HIV and AIDS as an opposing team, Johnson attempts to re-envision his relationship to temporality and politics, and such a reconfiguration becomes problematic for fans as they not only must adjust to his new body, right, his, his political body at rest, but also his body is occupying a specific political position that reimagines time itself. Yet it was only temporarily that Johnson could exist in the interstices between his athleticism and his HIV positive status, which is why many of you don't know that he actually had an MBA career, right? Because that's not the story we tell. Um, there's a bunch of moments that mark his shift from, a, from NBA star to AIDS icon to neither, right? That second half of the 1995-1996 season, his wife said he was healed in the name of Jesus. Uh, in 1998, he opened several Starbucks chains and movie theaters. Uh, not just in LA, but in other places as well. In 2002, pharma pharmaceutical advertisements capitalized on the fact that he still looked healthy to, uh, to sell antiretrovirals. In 2007, there was some more. In 2008, there were the radio disc jockeys. And all of these images, sorry, all these incidents mark moments when he began to somatize health according to a very narrow understanding of what healthy looks like, rather than risk. Given that media depictions of HIV and AIDS particularly as inscribed on uh, black bodies in Africa, still include emaciated individuals, Johnson's weight gain eclipses his HIV positive status. One could point out that Johnson exudes health in ways that are arbitrary, yet compelling for the general public. He has a healthy marriage, he makes a healthy living, and he owns healthy businesses. His son has a healthy public media image. 
Uh, for those of you who have not seen the memes, Queen EJ is now a thing. It's interesting, because um, he's got a really great fashion sense. His son has great fashion sense. Um, this new Johnson image is not magic, um, in that Johnson has become the former NBA star and now entrepreneur. Johnson's stasis relies, uh, sorry, results in a loss of the cultural cachet that accompanied his basketball career, including his ability to discuss with great urgency the risk of HIV and AIDS. Johnson's 2009 publication, When the Game Was Ours, co-authored with Larry Bird and Jackie McMullen, rhetorically reconfigures Magic's opponent as Larry Bird, not HIV and AIDS, recalling the days beforehand. And though they discuss HIV and AIDS in the book, it's no longer Johnson's opponent. It's this sort of thing that happened to him that he got over. Johnson had to submit to the death of his NBA career in order for his life to disabuse the public of their complacency vis-a-vis -vis HIV and AIDS. However, the long-term effect of his dead NBA career juxtaposed with his healthy looking, though not healthy, body is that Johnson sacrifices his efficiency as an activist given his survival, especially because his activism depended on him being very temporarily close to his sports career. In terms of HIV and AIDS activism, it appears that Johnson has used up his magic. The urgency he commanded as healthy looking and fit in 1991 is not the same urgency he, he can command as healthy looking and fit in the new millennium. And just like on the court, his body has its limits. So at the beginning of the talk, I said that this uh, discussion was timely. And I mentioned the Arab Spring and military involvement in Iraq and Afghanistan, pol police brutality, vigilante justice. I mentioned that many of us reckon with the way black and brown bodies are marked as fungible and disposable and ungrievable, and Ebola as this kind of cultural marker for us, uh, one that indexes a kind of lack of preparedness we have in cultural terms to talk about uh, infectious disease. I can't comment on the CDC's capability in terms of dealing with infectious disease, but as a public, we seem to have a low threshold. Um, to proactively, compassionately, and fairly handle illnesses that are not readily apparent, right? So we have a difficulty trying to figure out what it means when someone looks healthy but is not, right? Um, and what it means to compassionately deal with health threats that we can't see. My driving questions are trying to make sense of this, this mundane fact of life that is illness, because illness does happen to everyone at every time, and if you are not ill yet, you may very well become so. Um, I'm trying to make sense of how this mundane fact affects those already occupying a space of fungibility for other reasons, right? For women, for people of color, for the disabled, etc. And though healthy has no specific look, we must consider how we prepare and remind ourselves and the public that precaution ought not be a precursor to panic. And so as I close, um, and for those of you who are like, oh, thank God she's closing, um, I hear you. Um, <laughs> I want to draw your attention to a news article from Times Book Zine. Um, it's actually on display till March 27th, and it's entitled The Science of Epidemics. Uh, the headline in one of the articles uh, proclaims the end of AIDS, and the caption underneath says, San Francisco was ground zero for HIV in the US. Now it wants to be the first city in the world with no new infections, no stigma, and no deaths. Um, San Francisco was not the only place. There was also LA and New York, and it's very important to not take that out of the story, right? And so again, we see how important, what stories we tell, um, how important that is, right? Because when San Francisco presumes itself as ground zero, there's certain things that, that we can start to talk about, right? But if they have to include LA and New York, it gets messy. Mm -hmm. um, buried somewhere deep in that article, and I mean literally the last page, before the credits. Um, a physician warns people to tone down the rhetoric because it weakens messages about HIV and AIDS prevention. Uh, and the article does very little reflection on the fact that antiretrovirals are still prohibitively expensive for people without help. Um, those drugs cost about $8,000 a month. Uh, there's also no mention of the fact that San Francisco politics are a significant factor and what even makes this possible to consider. It's one of the few places in the country where there are queer folk in power. And last but not least, there's no mention of those surrounding areas in which this may not be a possibility, particularly off of the peninsula where San Francisco is. What about all those migrant workers in the Central Valley? What about Oakland? 
because HIV and AIDS didn't just stop at the San Francisco borders. So I close with a melange of the words from a poet I take up in another chapter in my book, Suhair Hamad, because I think poetry often does with, with very little language what we, what we critics need so much language to do. Um, and the, the rest of the words are hers. Shit is complicated, <laughs> and I don't know what to think, but I know for sure who will pay. In the world, it will be women, mostly colored and poor. Women will have to bury children and support themselves through grief. If there is any light to come, it will shine from the eyes of those who look for peace and justice after the rubble and the rhetoric are cleared and the phoenix has risen. A firm life, a firm life. We've got to carry each other now. You are either with life or against it. A firm life. So, uh, um, I'm currently writing a research paper on uh, HIV positivity as a minority identity. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just wondering, like, from a purely selfish standpoint, <laughs> if you have any it's insight on um, HIV as an identity and maybe some intersections because you talk about race a lot. Yeah, so um, it's interesting that you're calling it a minoritized identity. Um, and I think uh, it exists within a, a couple of bubbles of minoritized identity. So Chris Bell um, did a lot of research on HIV and AIDS as a disability, um, which places it within that realm of minoritized identity. Is it Chris Bell? Christopher M. Bell. Um, his articles are just a little bit difficult to find, um, but if you find my work, you'll find his. Um, because I cite him a lot. <laughs> um, I, I, one of the things that I find useful about thinking about it in in terms of think, in terms of a disability is that what you get um, is that it is is that the impairment of HIV positivity is one issue, right? It is something that is physiologically happening in the body, but the access to drugs and um, medication and diagnosis and what happens in terms of stigma that that is disability, that that is socially constructed, that that is um, crafted by the stories we tell. Uh, and so there's a distinction, say, between what's physiologically happening and what's socially constructed, and so that's one way of thinking about it. I do not think that it is possible, um, could someone close up, please? Um, I do not think that it is possible to actually consider disability apart, I'm sorry, disability or HIV and AIDS apart from things like race, gender, sexual orientation, uh, gender status, right? Um, because all of those things affect how you were treated. So there was a, a white straight woman who got up at the Republican National Convention in the 80s and made her statement about being infected with HIV from her husband. Um, and she was hailed as kind of the second coming, right? This housewife who just didn't know and her husband who was such a philanderer and everyone was so upset with him. Um, and she got to be the figure that people rallied around, and people rallied around Ryan White, and people rallied around Michael, um, sorry, Magic Johnson, but they don't necessarily rally around other folks, right? Mm -hmm. um, and Chris Bell talked about this, I think, um, in 2009, when we were in Germany? Yes, when we were in Germany, and people asked him, you know, what, what has your experience been like? And in, a, in an effort to shut down a Q&A, he said, well, someone was upset with me when I got, uh, when, I, when I was talking about uh, contracting HIV because I got it from uh, MSM, uh, men, men and men, uh, sexual contact. And the person, I guess the physician, the physician's assistant asked him, well, do you still practice uh, homosexuality? He said, no, I've perfected it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, don't think that, I don't think that you can view his subjectivity, right? His understanding of who he is as someone, or who he was as someone with AIDS, without understanding what that moment was and what those moments are for someone who's black, queer, and effeminate, right? So all of those intersected identities are going to come to bear. And if you're dealing with whiteness, then you also have to deal with the privileges that accompany it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Professor Pickens, what um, what are the sort of takeaways that you would want medical students or healthcare practitioners to take away to put into practice the the, the stuff that you're talking about? Ooh, um, 
I think the biggest thing, and I think this can't, this can't go without saying, is to listen to your patients. Um, when you have folks who are coming to you for assistance, their ways of being, their world making, are how they are going to understand their diagnoses and illnesses. And so if you only give them the information you think they need to have without listening to the questions or the stories they're telling themselves or the information they have access to, then you miss out on a large part of how they're going to be able to enact treatment. All right. So um, just as a really quick example, kind of thinking of the patient who comes in who's recently been infected with HIV, uh, with HIV in the, say, early 90s, and all they know is Magic Johnson. Um, whatever physician that gives them stats about, stats mostly related to white gay men populations and this person is black or this person is of color, this person is working class and doesn't give them the resources they need or doesn't explain to them in terms that are useful for them um, how they might go about receiving treatment, then they miss out on actually getting the person the help they need. Um, and I think that becomes particularly important um, as, as you are becoming a healthcare professional. If you are so afraid of transference that you don't sit with a patient and talk to them and ask them how they understand their diagnosis, then you, you're you not really a doctor, right? Um, and I say that as someone who would hate having my credentials diminished, right? So I'm kind of <laughs> picking at that point of pride, but it, I'm also trying to pinpoint the way that doctors are tasked with healing and the way that the cultural cachet they have as important people in our, um, in our world comes with a great deal of responsibility. It's very Spider-Man, to whom much is given, <laughs> much is required, um, which I think is actually biblical in Spider-Man, so I just, you know, credit what credit's due. Um, I think the other takeaway, uh, in addition to listening to your patients, is also um, to be very clear that the world that you occupy as a physician is not the world that everyone else occupies. So the stories that people are that people know about certain illnesses, like Ebola, like flesh-eating diseases, like superbugs, they get from a hysterical media hell bent on making you afraid of your own shadow. And so when you approach someone um, validating their fear but giving them information to help them, um, that transforms the relationship they'll have to their own health care. Um, and I think in addition to physicians, um, and healthcare practitioners, anyone who's a would-be patient, ask questions. Mm -hmm. um, you can't go in there expecting that the doctor will know exactly what you need to know. You have to ask questions about side effects, about you know trials, about you know what um, what potential diagnoses there are, and you you can't be afraid of receiving honest answers because the more information you have, the better equipped you are to deal with whatever's coming down the pipeline. Um, and that medicine has lost some of its communal aspect. It used to be uh, something that was treated, something that we that we treated communally. Um, and so, having a community around you, generally, is useful. But especially if you are dealing with something that is difficult for you, making sure that you have folks around you who will support you is incredibly important. And for doctors as well, you need folks around you who will support you in the fact that every day, say if you're dealing with rounds, you have to hold your pee, you have to figure out how to triage what's happening with your patient as well as your own emotions, as well as dealing with your attending physician and the nurses and the people who are, like there's a lot of stuff you have to deal with, but if you can find a community that's going to support you through being a physician, you will also be a better physician. Right? So I think community is important. If we lose that, we lose several aspects of what's gonna make um, our health care important. In addition to, I think, advocating for things like the Affordable Health Care Act to become a little bit more practical in their implementation, shall we say. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that question. Yeah. I'm actually wondering if you can just elaborate on something. Um, I think at a couple of points you mentioned the importance of compassion. Mm. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate on like what these compassionate acts would look like. Because I can imagine that when you say compassion, you know, are you imagining like I know I don't think you're imagining like a doctor going in and giving a patient a hug per se, or maybe <laughs> in certain situations, but I'm just wondering if you could make that a bit more elaborate on what that would look like or what you would hope that could look like yeah, in no, an actual setting. Thank you. Yeah, I do sometimes imagine folks hugging patients. <laughs> um, I have a follow-up. And, and, and I, I think 
sometimes it's appropriate and sometimes it's not. I think the 15 minute clinical hour that we spend with doctors is too short. Um, and I think if you had a nurse practitioner and a doctor in the same room, because they're usually never in the same room, you get the nurse, she takes your blood pressure, your temperature, your vitals, she leaves, usually it's a she, um, and then you get the doctor who's usually a he, and he comes in and is like, doesn't even look at the little questionnaire you filled out. And he's like, well, this is what is wrong. And are you okay? All right, bye. And then they're gone, right? Um, and in the hospital, the nurses and the doctors are never in the same room. I think if you have them in the same room together, you get a sense of compassion because they have to work with each other in addition to figuring out what's happening with you. So I think in, in one way that would be useful. Although from a practical standpoint, I can see why it doesn't happen. Um, particularly at a place like Ronald Reagan. Um, and if you've ever been there on a Friday or Saturday night, it's a zoo. Um, uh, I think from a policy standpoint, uh, health insurance companies uh, don't enact compassion when they don't listen to medical doctors providing information about what patients need. Um, <clears throat> and I won't say anything about the health insurance company that I have now <laughs> for fear. <laughs> that they will decide she doesn't need anything. <laughs> um, but I think, I think if, uh, if decisions were actually made by medical personnel um, and we dealt with uh, consistent preventative care and self-care, um, and I, you know, some people think self-care, they think, oh, go get a manicure, pedicure, go get a massage. I'm thinking, do you know what your vital signs are generally? Do you know what your blood pressure runs? Do you know what your liver function is? Do you know all of those things, right? If you had a baseline for all of those, right, as part of your ongoing care, if we were taught to think of ourselves as bodies in progress, right, much the way we think of therapy um, as psychotherapy as an ongoing process, if we thought about physical care as an ongoing process, that would enact a kind of compassion for ourselves and it would also give people something to follow in terms of the stories that they know about us as patients. Um, and it would also remind folks that there's a set of contexts in which a life is lived, right? So I'll tell you something about me. In the past week, I have moved, I have finished a book project, and I have prepared myself to travel here, right? So if I had gotten sick, um, my baseline, right, would need to be something against which we would measure all of that stress right, and all of that difficulty. And because I have a chronic illness, there is a baseline. For someone who experiences an event, like a cardiac event or a nervous breakdown, because um, moving will do that to you, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> while all of these things are happening and they have no baseline, they won't get treated with a kind of context and compassion, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's, there's that. Um, so I think it, it happens on a number of levels. I'm thinking policy and procedure, say health insurance companies, um, the Affordable Health Care Act by not dealing, by not allowing people to be denied by virtue of a pre-existing condition and, and taking away lifetime limits enact some of that compassion. Having more personnel invested and involved with you at the same time would be a moment of compassion, I think. Um, and then also giving people the context of their lives to deal with is also useful um, in terms of compassion. And then there's also the compassion, and I'm thinking I'm talking particularly about doctors and patients, but I'm also thinking about the way that we interact with people we know who are sick, right, or who are experiencing something. That pity, that's not helpful. Um, but that moment, and that moment of do you need anything, and it's just being asked out of politeness, also not helpful. <laughs> but that moment when you come over with a crock pot full of food, and paper plates, <laughs> and napkins and forks, and you're like, here, I'm going to stay with you 15 minutes so you don't get tired. I'm going to serve you some food, and then here's the rest of it for you to have later. And I can get my crock pot whenever you want. <laughs> or somebody else will come and take it from you and deliver. Right? These things actually happened to me when I was writing my dissertation. When I needed assistance, my community was there for me. Right? People called me on the phone, and they listened when I was giving the answer to how are you, and they didn't judge. They also said things like, well, that sucks. It wasn't like, how can I fix it? It was like, well, damn, I'm sorry. Stuff is happening to you, mm -hmm. right? This, it's those moments, I think, of compassion. Um, and I think, uh, you know, when you are, I spent a lot of time at UCLA's oncology center because the treatments that I get required that I be in the infusion center. So I was around a lot of breast cancer patients. Um, and the people with liver cancer or lung cancer, 
got treated a lot differently from their communities and the people with breast cancer. Breast cancer was, oh my goodness, it's not your fault. Oh, it's so terrible being a woman. I can't believe you're going through this. They're gonna cut off your boobs. Oh my God. But the people with lung cancer was like, why were you smoking? Mm -hmm. What were you doing? Very different treatment. So the, the community, the way that, that the way that stigma affects your treatment is also um, significant and important. So I think compassion from person to person is not just about physicians and patients, but about patients and would-be patients. Yes? Thank you, Professor Thank for you. this uh, presentation, <laughs> which I learned a lot from. I'm trying to formulate a question, but it, it's around an experience I've had with a member of my family who is diabetic. Mm -hmm. And the doctor says, you're doing well. And I always say, in parentheses, for a black woman of your age. Yeah. And so the question I'm trying to formulate has to do with when it, how can we know or when is it necessary for physicians or other medical people to toggle back and forth between you speaking to an individual or you're speaking to someone whose experience might have something to do with their socioeconomic status, yes. their gender, their race, you know, their culture. Yeah. Uh, because you, those things can be significant, mm -hmm. but at other times, this person is can be an outlier from the group. Yeah. And when is that person ever being spoken to as an individual? That's a really tough question. I think it has a lot to do with whether the doctor is culturally competent enough to know the difference. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, for many issues, and I think for, for diabetes in particular, because of its high incidence among black folk and among black folk of a certain age, one of the things that I think is significant for physicians to deal with is that they are talking to individuals who they see as representative of groups. Um, and so in some ways the onus is on the doctor to talk about, well, this is what's happening generally and this is where you are. So the person can actually see themselves as, as part of a community. But I think also um, if you are that individual, you, you may also need to place some of the onus on yourself to remind the doctor that you are doing things that are different from or um, are not participating in kind of a, a group or cultural moment. Um, so mm -hmm. we were actually having a conversation about diabetes and tea at lunch and how people kind of bring with them packets of sweet and low. Um, but there's also, I, I think in that moment is an, is an accommodation, a self-accommodation, right, where, where the person begins to see themselves as part of a community with diabetes that has to do certain things. Mm -hmm. Um, but then also has to take that moment of accommodation with them into the doctor's office to say things like, well, am I doing well, am, am I doing as well as I can be, or am I doing as well as you expect me to be given these moments, given these other folks against whom you're comparing me? Um, and I think that the difference between that question, the, the difference embedded in that question would, should usually make a doctor think twice about whether they are comparing you to a, a very large group of generally individuals with diabetes or a group of black folk, black women, a certain age with diabetes, right? Because the, the swaths of information are, are radically different. Um, and there, and I think it's important to ask questions, but in those questions, you begin to hold the doctor accountable. Like, you should know this information. Um, because they should. 